Good day, Grade 12s. Welcome to this next lesson in Physical Science. As you recall, we are busy revising our physics for your paper, which is on the 10th of November, which is on Thursday. Yay! And then you'll be finished physics. So let's get going. If you recall, we were busy working through this question on the photoelectric effect, okay? And the first thing they asked us to do was to find the work function, which we did. Um, and remember I said to you, exam guidelines, exam guidelines, exam guidelines. It is super important that you make sure you've got your hands on the exam guidelines and you find all your definitions in the exam guidelines. Okay, the next thing that we're going to do is we're now going to work out the work function the metal uses as a cathode. So what the information they gave us was that it is found that light of 500 nanometers, and remember I said to you that was 10 to the negative 9, so the wavelength of 500 times by 10 to the negative 9 meters releases electrons with zero kinetic energy. So in other words, that light there matches the work function, okay? And it says to calculate the work function. So we said E equals HF, or the work function equals H frequency zero, where that is the threshold frequency. But we know that the wave equation is equal to C is equal to lambda F, okay? And we have the lambda, we don't have the frequency, but C is the speed of light and we've got the wavelength, so we can substitute that into this. So therefore we've got the Planck's constant. It is 6.63 times by 10 to the negative 34. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a blonde day, so I just want to check that. Okay, I'm right. 6.63 times by 10 to the negative 34. So therefore, this is 6 comma 63 times by 10 to the negative 34 multiplied by the threshold frequency. But instead of the threshold frequency, we're going to use C over the wavelength. Now, C is the speed of light, so that's 3 times by 10 to the 8 all over the wavelength which they gave us which was 500 times by 10 to the negative 9. So now all we need is a calculator, so let's do that. Okay, so we've got 6 point, point, 6.3 exponent, where am I? Um, exponent negative 34 multiplied by 3 exponent 8 equals divided by 500 exponent negative 9 equals and you get 3.97 times by 10, so negative 19. In fact, I'm wrong because that 8 makes us round up. So it's 3.98 times by 10 to the negative 19. So that work function is 3,98 times by 10 to the negative 19. And remember that we're working out the work function. What is the work function? The work function is always measured in joules so therefore this is joules because the work function is energy right now next question says how will each of the following affect the reading on the microammeter now remember the microammeter measures the current and the current is the rate at which the electrons are flowing okay so choose it says choose from increases decreases remains the same the intensity of the light as it's increased. Okay, so what's interesting about this is that if it increases your intensity, do you agree that it's going to increase? The intensity increases the rate um, at which electrons are emitted the rate at which electrons are emitted. So it doesn't affect the, um, so therefore it's actually going to increase, it's going to increase the current because of the fact that it increases the rate at which the electrons 
are emitted. Now it says light over wavelength of 550 nanometers is used. Now what's interesting about this is that increasing the frequency is going to increase the kinetic energy of the electrons and therefore because of that it's also going to increase the current but it increases the current for two totally different reasons and you need to understand that okay the one is increasing the current for the simple reason that it's increasing the rate at which the electrons are being emitted so therefore there's more current more electrons per unit time and therefore your current will be increased whereas the other one is increased because of the fact that it is increasing the kinetic energy of the electrons. Okay, so now next it says the metal cathode is now irradiated with light of 400 nanometers. 400 nanometers. Actually, hang on. A wavelength of 500 nanometers is actually, sorry, I made a mistake. Oh, oh, oh sorry. A wavelength of light 550 nanometers is going to have no effect. It's going to remain the same. And the reason for this is because 500 nanometer wavelength is not going to cause any electrons to be emitted. And if that's the case, it means that there will still be no current on it, so therefore it will still have a zero reading. So that's quite a sneaky question there. Okay, and now it says, the metal cathode is now irradiated with a wavelength of 400 nanometers. Calculate the maximum kinetic energy of the emitted electron. Okay, so we know that E is equal to the work function plus um, EK, which in turn, well, okay, they just want the maximum kinetic energy. So this is the work function which we've already worked out. It's 3.98 times by 10 to the negative 19. E is equal to HF. So we can say Planck's constant, which is 6, 63 times by 10 to the negative 34, multiplied by, again, we're going to have to use C over lambda, but this time we're using 400 nanometers. So it's going to be 3 times by 10 to the 8 over 400 times by 10 to the negative 9 is equal to the WO plus EK. Do you agree? So let's work out what this is first. So that is going to be 6.63 exponent negative 34 multiplied by 3 exponent 8 let's try again that is wrong exponent 8 equals divided by 400 exponent negative 9 equals and that becomes 4.97 times by 10 to the negative 19. So that is 4.97 times by 10 to the negative 19 joules. So that is the energy of the incident light. The work function is 3.98. So do you agree the kinetic energy is going to be E minus the work function. So it's the 4.97 times by 10 to the minus 19 minus 3 through 3.98 times by 10 to the negative 19. So, excuse me, we can say minus 3.98 exponent negative 19 equals 9.95 times by 10 to the negative 20. So it's 9.93, okay, is equal to 9.93 times by 10 to the negative 20. And remember, we're measuring the kinetic energy. So this is joules. Right, excellent, nice question. Right, next question. It now says, a learner sets up a circuit shown below to measure the internal resistance of the battery. 
Okay, so we've got a battery here which has some internal resistance. There's an external resistor which has got a rear stat. This is a rear stat, which means we can change that resistance. There's a voltmeter and an ammeter. Okay, and what is it saying? It is saying that first it says define the e term EMF. And EMF is the maximum voltage that can be supplied to a circuit by a um, cell or volt or, or battery. Okay, so there's maximum volts that can be supplied to the circuit. Next it says calculate the gradient of the graph. Okay, so let us calculate the gradient of the graph. So let us choose two points. We can choose this point here and the end point because those two points it looks like it's going through perfectly. So remember the gradient is change in y over change in x, right? Do you agree? So the gradient is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Okay, so this point here is going to be, that's 3.8, 3, 3,8 minus, we're choosing this point here, 1.1, 1.2, 1 1.3, over, this is 8, but that's 10, so that's actually exactly 9, yeah, it's 9 minus this one here is going to be 0 0.2, so it's 2.2. .2. So let's get out our calculator and work out what this gradient is, and then we'll work out what it stands for. So it's going to be a fraction, and it's 3.8 minus 1.3 over... over 9 minus 2.2 .2 equals, try again, 0, 0,37. So this is 0, 0,37, and we'll work out what the unit is in a minute. But do you see that's quite sneaky? Because they've got the y axis is in big values of 1, 2, 3, and 4, and the x axis is 2, 4, 6, 8, which they can do. There's no problem with that, okay? But what you need to realize is that, therefore, when you read it off, you have to be very careful that you don't mess up those calculations. Now, let's work out what the gradient is made of. Okay, so remember the gradient is the y, which is amps to negative 1, over ohms, over the ohms, which is the same as saying 1 over the amps multiplied by 1 over the ohms. Okay, do you agree? Which is basically giving us 1 over IR. Okay, do you agree? Now we know that V is equal to IR. So therefore, do you agree that 1 over V is going to give me 1 over IR? So therefore, the, what is represented by the gradient is actually going to be volts to the negative 1. It's the inverse of the volts. Okay. Now it says use information on the graph to calculate the EMF of the battery. Okay. Well, the EMF of the battery would be given by what? Okay. Do you agree that this is giving me a reading of 0,5 amps when there is zero current, zero external resistance? That's not possible. It's weird. Okay, so therefore we can say, do you agree that V is going to be the inverse of this? So do you agree I can take the inverse of this? Hang on, let me just find it. I've got to find the inverse button. 
It's x the negative one in case you're wondering where, what I'm looking for. It's x the negative one. <sighs> there it is. x the negative one equals. So therefore that is 2.72. So 2.72 is the voltage that this graph is given me, which is the current versus the external resistance. Okay, the current versus the external resistance would give me the voltage. Okay, V equals IR. Um, yeah, so this is 2.72 volts. Okay, now that there is giving me the voltage to the circuit. Do you agree? That is giving me the voltage to the circuit. So I could get the EMF of this Sorry, I'm a little bit confused because I don't know how you're getting a current reading if your external resistance is. Of course, you can get a current reading if your external resistance is zero. Okay, if your current reading is going to be equal to 0, 0,5 when your external resistance is zero, then you could get the internal resistance of the battery. Do you agree? Um, because you're getting, yeah, okay. So when the external resistance of the circuit, but then you're gonna get, yeah, there's something wrong with this question. We're gonna ignore this question, it's, there's something wrong. Okay, we're moving on to the next exam paper. Sorry, I don't know, there was something wrong with it. You're not supposed to get a current. Okay, because it's supposed to short circuit if there's no, resistance. Okay, a, rail, a railway coal track moving with the constant velocity collides the similar track, which is stationary. Okay, in this exam paper, I've actually decided to do the multiple choice. And the reason I've decided to do the multiple choice is I do find that a lot of students do actually struggle with the multiple choice. Um, and they find it very frustrating to do well. So for that reason, I have decided to do the multiple choice on this paper. Okay, so it says, a railway coal track moving with a constant velocity collides with a similar track, which is stationary. Both trackles be tracks become coupled together and move off in the same direction as the first track. So we think in momentum here, do you agree? Which one of the following statements correctly describes the system making up the two tracks above? Okay, first of all, the first one is both the momentum and the kinetic energy is conserved. Neither momentum nor the kinetic energy is conserved. The momentum is conserved, but the kinetic energy is not conserved. And the kinetic energy is conserved, but the momentum is not conserved. Okay, the way this works is rule of thumb, that if, if the objects um, join, okay, each other, once they have um, been in a collision, then the theory is that that, it means that it is, not conservative when it comes to kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is not conserved. And because both tracks have coupled, the kinetic energy is not conserved. So therefore we can say that it's not A, it is not T, okay? There is no reason, because they don't mention any type of kinetic, I mean friction, or anything else interfering with this reaction for momentum not to be conserved. So therefore the correct answer would be that momentum is conserved but the kinetic energy is not. Now it says which one of the following statements is false. An object can have zero velocity even though its acceleration is not zero. Well acceleration is change in velocity over change in time. Um, so that's interesting, let's carry on. A constant velocity, even though it's change, it's though its speed is changing. Okay, a constant acceleration, even though its velocity is changing. A constant acceleration, even though its velocity is reversing direction. 
Okay, so it says which one of the following statements is false? An object can have a zero velocity even though its acceleration is not zero. Okay, um, let's think about that. Can you have a zero velocity even if your acceleration is not zero? Acceleration equals change in velocity over change in time. But remember that it is also a vector, so it's got direction. But if you've got a zero velocity, your acceleration is definitely going to be zero. So therefore, I would say that this is your false statement. Next, it says a constant resultant force acts on an object which moves from rest in a straight line. Okay, so you've got F net equals MA, right? It says which one of the following graphs base shows the relationship between, between momentum of the body and time while this constant force is acting on the object. Okay, momentum P is equal to M delta V. But we also know that F net, um, you've got impulse, okay, and F net over delta T is equal to delta P. Hang on, let me fix that for you. Um, momentum is given by the following equations, okay. You have got that Sorry, I don't know what's going on with my head at the moment. Just let me fix this, shall we? We have F net delta T equals delta P, right? So now it's saying the constant resultant force acts on the body, and we therefore have that F net is equal to delta P over delta T. So the gradient of this will be constant. If there's a net force, the gradient is going to be constant, okay? So therefore, it has to be B because it means it's going to get a straight line graph. This one here, yes, P is constant, but T is changing. Yeah, it is not constant at all. So the only answer it can be is B. Nice question. Okay, now it says, the diagram below shows the track ABC, ABC. Curved section is frictionless. The rough horizontal section here is eight meters long. Okay. An object of mass 10 kgs is released from point A, which is four meters above the ground. It slides down the track, whee, and comes to rest at C. Which one of the following statements about the mechanical energy of the 10 kilogram mass is incorrect? Okay, first of all, it says the mechanical energy increases from A to B. That is incorrect. Okay. <laughs> so that is definitely incorrect because the total mechanical energy at the top here should equal the total mechanical energy at the B. So there we go. That was an easy one. Next. A bird flies, is di flies directly away from a stationary bird watcher at a constant velocity. Okay, so here's the stationary bird watcher with his binoculars, and there's his hands, and there's his googly eyes. Okay, and here is the little bird. Yes, I'm a terrible artist. And it's flying away at a constant velocity. The bird constantly emits sound waves at a frequency of 1650 hertz. Okay. Which one of the following combinations of properties of sound heard by the bird watcher as the bird flies away? Okay, wait, let's try again. Which one of the following combinations of properties of the sound heard by the bird watcher as the bird flies away? So the bird flies directly away from the stationary at a constant velocity. The bird constantly emits sound, okay? Which one of the following combinations of properties of the sound heard by the bird watcher as the bird flies away is correct? Okay, do you agree that if the bird is going off at a constant velocity, it remains the same, the frequency is still going to decrease 
because of the fact that it is bird is moving away from it and therefore the frequency is going to decrease so the correct answer is b okay now it says which of the following statements about the alternating current generator is true okay right is true the minimum voltage produced is not zero volts okay the emf produced decreases as the number of windings in the armatures increases that's false the maximum value of the alternating current can be increased by increasing the period of rotation that is false the maximum value of the alternating current produced can be increased by increasing the speed of the rotation of the coil the maximum value of the alternating current can be produced that is false i mean it's true the maximum value of the alternating current produced can be increased by increasing the speed of rotation is true there you go a circuit is set up as shown in the diagram below okay the emf of the bolt battery is 12 volts the voltmeter reads 4 volts and 10 volts the battery has no internal resistance yay and the resistance of the conducting wires can be ignored the value of x is okay so x plus the four ohms uses up four volts do you agree but the four ohms plus z uses up 10 volts okay and there's a total of 12 volts available okay so do you agree that we have got x plus 4 plus z has to equal x plus 4 plus z has to equal 12 volts okay therefore x plus z has to equal 8 volts right so x plus z has to equal 8 volts um right but we also have that x plus 4, x plus 4 is equal to 4 volts. Therefore, x has to equal to, no, that's not working at all, is it? We can think about it, though. Let's have a look at what they're saying. Okay, let me have a look at what they're saying. They're saying that if this was two ohms then do you agree that that would give you a six ohm resistor um, hmm that's a nice question I have to admit this is a nice question this is actually a very nice question okay let's have a look at it we have got that this is x plus four gives you V okay so do you agree the same current is flowing through all of this do you agree so V is equal to IR do you agree in this case 4 is equal to I times by X plus 4 okay therefore I this is much better is 4 over X plus 4 okay similarly over here we've got that I is going to equal to 10 over 4 plus Z. Do you agree? Because the current in the series circuit is always the same. So therefore we've got 4 over X plus 4 is going to equal to 10 over 4 plus Z. Okay. If we cross multiply, we've got 4 times 4 plus z is going to equal 10 times x plus 4. So we've got 16 plus 4z is equal to 10x plus 40. So if we take all the x and y, the x and z to one side, we've got 4z minus 10x is equal to 40 minus 16 divide everything by 2 so you got 2z minus 5x 
is equal to 40 minus 16 is 24, so this is 12. And that's equation one. Now we also had that 12 over x plus 4 plus z is equal to i. Okay. So therefore, we can say that 12 over x plus 4 plus z is equal to, it doesn't really matter, whoopsie, is equal to 10 over 4 plus z. So if we rearrange this, we've got 12 times 4 plus z is equal to 10 times 4 plus x plus z. Sure, what a long question. So this becomes 48 plus 12z is equal to 40 plus 10x plus 10z. Okay, it might have been easier just to plug the numbers and see what you get. So therefore you've got 8 um, is equal to take that across, minus 2x plus, no, I'm wrong, sorry, 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 is equal to 10x, 10x minus 2z, so therefore we've got that minus z is equal to um, 4 plus 5x, 4 minus 5x, so therefore z is equal to 5x minus 4, so we can substitute into here, so you've got 2 times 5x minus 4 minus 5x is equal to 12, and now I need to, I'm running out of space. Sure, this is a nice question. Very nice question. Okay, so then we can say, well, then we've got 10x minus 8 minus 5x is equal to 12. So you've got 5x is equal to 20. So x equals 4 ohms, ta-da. So the answer is B. Okay, right. It might have been slightly easier if you just randomly tried to substitute the numbers in. Okay, right. Let's carry on, shall we? Okay. The diagram represents... Okay, this is... Okay, well, we'll go out anyway, just in case. Um, a diagram represents three energy levels, X, Y, and Z in a certain atom. The energy difference between the levels is three times the energy levels between X and Y. The energy level from Y to Z is three times the energy level from X to Y. So this year is three times the split year, okay? If the wavelength on the photon is emitted as a result of transition from X to Z is lambda, what is the wavelength of the photon emitted in transition from X to Y? Okay, so do you agree that this whole thing would be 4X then? Okay, so therefore this is going to be a quarter. So the correct answer is D. Right, diagrams below represent different spectral lines of an element. Diagram one represents the spectrum of the element in the lab on Earth. Okay, so blue with three lines. Okay, blue, red. Okay, three lines. Diagrams two and three represent the spectrum of the same element on a different star. Diagrams for blue with spectrum. Okay, right. The following conclusions are made from the above diagrams. Okay, so this is the same thing. Do you agree that this one has been blue shifted and this has been red shifted? Okay, this is definitely blue shifted, that's definitely red shifted. And we know that red shift means away. Okay, so the following conclusion said, according to diagram two, the distance between the earth and the star is decreasing, is true. According to diagram three, the distance between the earth and star is constant, is false. 
Okay, the wavelengths of the corresponding spectral lines in, is, is the wavelengths of the corresponding spectral lines in diagram two are the longest. Okay, so let's think about this. Blue is a higher frequency, and if it's a higher frequency, it's going to be a lower wavelength. So therefore, that's false. The only thing that is correct is A. Right, again, multiple choice. It says, during the investigation, the light of different frequencies is shone onto a metal cathode of a photocell. Okay, the kinetic energy of the emitted electrons is measured. The graph below shows the results. So you've got kinetic energy and you've got frequency. Which one of the following combinations can be deduced from the above graph? Okay, first of all, the kinetic energy is the dependent variable because it's dependent on the frequency. So the independent variable is going to be the frequency. So it's there for this and this, okay? Then they said, what is the threshold frequency? And the threshold frequency is whatever you measure here, which looks like it's gonna be nine times by 10 to the 14. So therefore the correct answer is D. Awesome. Next question. Ah, finally, on to the long questions. It says, write down Newton's second law in words. Okay, so I'm cheating and I'm writing F net equals mass times acceleration. Obviously, you guys can't do that. You need to write out the proper Newton's second law, which says that basically, um, if an object is... Okay, if a constant force, is a net force is applied to an object, the object will accelerate in um, with an acceleration that is directly proportional to the force and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. Okay, right, so that is Newton's second law, which effectively is F net equals MA, but you cannot just write it. Okay, but what are they hinting? They're hinting that we're going to need this in this question here. Yeah. Okay, it says a block of mass 12 kilograms resting on a rough horizontal table, something in friction already, is connected by a light inextensible string which passes over a frictionless pulley. No friction here. Don't have to worry about the mass of the string. Okay, over to a mass of 7.5 kg. The 7.5 kg block hangs vertically. A force of magnitude F is applied to the 12 kilogram block at an angle of 30 degrees to horizontal. The maximum coefficient of static friction, mu s, is 0, 0,45. Okay, so we're right. It says calculate the tension T. Okay. Right. Uh, right. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to draw two free body diagrams. Okay, one for the 12 kilogram block and one for the 7.5 kilogram block. And then I'm going to use it. But actually, hang on. It's only a two mark question. And to calculate, oh, it's the stationary at the moment. The force, Okay, at the moment, this is stationary. Do you agree? So therefore, the force tension T has to equal the force of gravity as it is. It says it hangs vertically. Yeah, okay, so it's only two marks. So it's not complicated. All we're saying is that because this whole thing is stationary, the T has to equal the force of gravity. And the force of gravity is just 7, 5 times by 9 comma eight mass times gravity, which we can work out. It's 7.5 multiplied by 9.8. See, this is delete, delete, 0.8, which equals SD 73 comma five. That is going to be 73 comma five newtons. So that is the force at the moment, 73 comma five newtons. Right, grade 12, that's it for me for today. We will continue with this tomorrow. Have a great day.